Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, in this week's show, I'll be chatting to clinical psychologist and neuroscientist Ian Robertson. His brand new book, How Confidence Works, looks at the science behind confidence, where it comes from, why it's not something we're born with, but it is something we can learn. Ian is with me today to discuss confidence and why it's so important to our overall health. Ian, welcome to the show. How's it going? Going great, Carl. It's lovely to talk to you. Uh, and and you too. I, you have a voice I could listen to for for forever. Uh, You've got a lovely a lovely tone to your voice. Um, let's kick. Let's get stuck into it straight away. So I want to start off by asking, you, obviously, what is confidence uh, and why do we need it? Confidence is what distinguishes human beings from all other species. It's the ability to envisage something in the future and to work towards it. Um, and confidence is the belief that you can do that. And there's two elements to confidence. There's the can do. Yes, I can uh, change my diet. And then there's a the can happen. Yes, if I change my diet, my health will improve. So you need the two strands of the bridge to really have the full, the full whammy of confidence. So essentially confidence is a belief that you can do something and that if you do something, a good thing will happen as a result. And what that does is it really has profound effects on your brain and therefore on your emotions and on your body indeed, because the expectation of success uh, makes that success more likely. And is confidence or, and self-belief, is, is, it the, is that the same thing to be, you know, to believe yes. in yourself and to be confident? And are they the exact same thing? They are the same thing, but the, the critical thing about confidence is that that makes it different from, say, optimism or hope or self-esteem is that confidence is linked to action, to specific action. So um, self-belief, you can have self-belief uh, about yourself on the football field, but not self-belief about yourself in the discotheque, you know, uh, or the or the club. So, so self-belief is, 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 is tied to specific actions, specific realms of behavior. Um, and so, yes, in, in that sense, however, confidence about being able to do something uh, is, is the same as self-belief about being able to do something. And one of the things in the introduction, which I think is really interesting, is that even if it's something you're not born with, it is a learned skill. It's something that we can learn to be more confident in our life. And to, as a skill, it's something that we can develop. Absolutely. I've, I've had to do that throughout my life. Um, Carl, I, I you know, was brought up in, you know, your social class is a, a big shaper of your confidence. And I was born very working class Glasgow um, uh, and, you know, have become more confident in life, uh, much more than I was as a teenager, for, for example. Um, and so what confidence is, it's a set of beliefs and it's a set of habits. And the great thing is beliefs and habits are both changeable. So yes, you can learn the, the, how, how to become more confident, which is really important for people. And this will sound like a very strange question, but I think it's really interesting. For people listening in who would regard themselves as being extremely confident or somewhat overconfident, can you, can you reverse that habit on the, on the flip side of the coin? That if you're that kind of almost uh, brash is the wrong word, but a very uh, extremely confident person, sometimes too confident, is it possible to unlearn that? Well, the prop the problem is, Carl, if you are one of these very, as you say, brash or very overconfident people, because confidence is such a valuable resource, um, people don't want to give it up, even if they're overconfident. Overconfidence tends to cause problems for other people <laughs> <laughs> because what over what overconfidence you know this brash displays of confidence tend to not always but tend to make people more dominant more persuasive makes them good salesmen and um, it, it gives them it buys them higher status so the display of confidence of overconfidence is a kind of primitive dominant signal that um, buys you big influence, and that is very valuable. <laughs> and so, people people who are over people who are underconfident are very aware of it. 
people who are overconfident tend to be less aware of it, or even if they are aware of it, they value it and so don't want to give it up. <laughs> and I just had listening to you there straight away, I can think of some of the global, uh, I was going to say wellness speakers, I wouldn't actually describe them as being wellness speakers whatsoever. But the, those global speakers, they are, you know, people go to pay big money to go and see at live events and things like that when they were a thing. They are that very much that overconfident, uh, and that's almost a sales pitch when you go to watch them. Yeah, and that's and that's what people are paying big money for. Yes, they're paying for the music, but really they're paying to be in contact with celebrity. They're paying, and they don't believe that they will they will somehow be changed by that celebrity. But there is this attraction of high status therefore dominant people to just merely be in contact with them there's this primitive feeling that that will brush off on you <laughs> <laughs> and so what you really are what you really are paying for is to be in, in, in touch with overconfidence <laughs> in these big celebrities and if they weren't overconfident in that kind of brash showbiz way they wouldn't be celebrities and you wouldn't be paying money to go and see them Let's chat about the impact of people on people's confidence of, I suppose, COVID uh, and what has been a very challenging time. So over the last kind of 14 to 16 months, has people, how have people's confidence taken a hit? Definitely has, um, Carl. Um, per particularly for people who are, at, um, if you like, uh, vulnerable stages in their lives, for instance, teenagers who are just trying to find their way in their social life, young people just going into college and their first year is just all online and they're sitting at home in their bedroom and they're not, they're not building the confidence and, and overcoming the anxiety of that's in, inevitably involved in interacting with other people and, and all that exciting but also scary stuff that goes on. And then there's another group older people who's maybe maybe on their own, they're maybe bereaved or they're maybe retired, um, who, who don't have a, a kind of secure home base to maintain their confidence. There's people in the middle like me for whom, you know, the, with a, a, a blessed with a, a lovely family who have my own kind of built in community where I live. So, con you know, COVID has, hasn't affected me at all, but there are millions of people who have lost jobs, who, where relationships are under strain, perhaps because they're in a smaller apartment, you know, trapped, trying to work with ch children. So there's a lot of people who are really, uh, um, who, who, where life is, the, the habits of life have been shaken up in a way that makes things less predictable. And when when we can't predict what was what, what is happening, that means we have to consciously plan for it. And that requires us to, to, to do things that maybe we're not used to doing, which is setting goals for ourselves, structuring our time, because normally in everyday life, our life is pretty much structured by the, if, we, if we're working, commuting to work by going to the, you know, going out to the pub, going to the cafe, picking up the children, there's a structure to it, and suddenly that structure has been taken away, and we're, we're kind of thrown in our own resources, and that, that, for many people, that's hugely confidence sapping. But because, um, you know, a lot of people, I mean, millions of people are a bit, not everyone's an extrovert. A lot of people can find meeting new people slightly anxiety arousing, you know, until they get to know them. Going into a new job slightly, you know, it, everyone feels, think, think how you felt when you, after the long holidays, when you went back to school, you know, the, the, the Sunday night before, there was always a bit of butterflies in the stomach, much more for some people than others. Well, this is one big butterflies in the stomach uh, going, you know, the day before going back to school, multiplied by 100 for many, many hundreds of thousands of people. And anxiety is a real um, enemy of confidence. And confidence is a wonderful antidote to anxiety. That is prof that's a phenomenal statement, and I absolutely love it. I've never heard it put like that before, but it's 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 really really well put. So for people listening in who, who whose confidence has been affected, just from listening to you there, it's very much along the lines of that. 
almost like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs in terms of how to improve your confidence, that security of people around you, that, that, that social context of people around that all those different elements play a role in building your confidence, or do they? They do, they do. Um, and when they change, in times of change, which is what COVID has been, confidence comes at a real premium. It's really what we need. And one of the best ways of building confidence is by achieving small successes, setting clear goals for ourselves that stretch us a little bit, but that are not too distant or difficult to achieve. Because what happens when you, even if the goal is, look, I'm finally going to clear out that cupboard. You know, I'm, I'm sitting at home this weekend, it's raining. You know, I haven't been out for ages. Okay, I'm just going, I'm, I'm going to clear out that cupboard that's been, you know, for years has been bothering me. Just setting that goal and achieving it actually gives you a little lift it, because ticking off a goal on a, on a list gives your brain a little um, burst of uh, dopamine activity in the reward network of the brain. And that is a natural mood lifter and anxiety reducer. So if you structure your time uh, with goals, that really is a major practical route towards uh, building your confidence. Because one of the problems with anxiety is anxiety, and this has been shown in the study of 40 countries around the world, anxious people do less stuff. And that's because anxiety makes you avoid, tend to avoid, or you, you text someone, oh, I, I'm not coming tonight because um, I've got a headache, you know. So anxiety makes you pull back uh, from life. And um, what what um, setting what action does is to setting goals for yourself does is make you take overcome that anxiety and take action. So as the Persian poet Rumi says, the road only appears with the first step. And so if you just force yourself, in spite of uh, anxiety, to just do that goal, that will be a major step towards gradually getting control of that anxiety. And the other the other famous quip is Woody Allen saying, showing up is 80% of life. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. Just the, the anxiety pulls you back from showing up and just showing up actually delivers chemical changes to your brain that lift your mood, reduce your anxiety and build your confidence. As someone who suffers from social anxiety from time to time, I what you're saying makes full on sense, particularly if it's big groups or big groups of people, it's making that small step to go. So my own personal level, it's like I arrange to meet one person, maybe outside as a small step and then go in with that person as a way of managing the anxiety of going into a big room full of people or something like that. And that's it is a, the, the small little goal, the small little step are huge stepping stones. That's a brilliant example, Carl. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Um, let's take it on to imposter syndrome. So something that uh, I've read a lot about, I've seen a lot about over the course of the last while. What is it? And just let's chat through that a little bit as well. So imposter syndrome is 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 something that um, is probably quite healthy to feel a bit of it. And why do I say that? Well, confidence is about learning to do things before you feel quite ready to do them. <laughs> you know, it's about just making that step into the uncomfortable realm where you're not 100%, um, you're not 100% certain you can do it. You're, you're kind of making a bet on yourself that you can do this, you know, with a small bet. And so in that sense, if we pull that off, <laughs> you know, if we pull that off, Inevitably, feel who, you know, I didn't really feel ready to do that, but I did it. So there's a kind of mini, mini, tiny imposter syndrome there that whoa, I'm faking it here. But actually, confidence is all about a slight amount of faking it, because we most healthy people, psychologically healthy people, are slightly self-critical, and, and that's what makes us nice people. Um, the people who are not self, who have no self criticism, have have, do, have low self awareness, and they tend to be the people that <laughs> are real, real pains, <laughs> cause cause other people an awful lot of problems. So, so a bit, a, a tiny bit of imposter syndrome is probably healthy and normal, 
what, what's, when it becomes too much is, and this happens particularly to, to women compared to men, is the feeling that, you know, you're, and it happens to perfectionists uh, very much. The people, you know, people who, who really get anxious about if they don't do something absolutely right. So they get promoted in their, in their work and, and they feel they have to, they feel they have to do everything perfectly, be a perfect boss, and that causes them anxiety. And they feel, oh, I'm, I, I'm not really, uh, I don't deserve this position. I'm, 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 I'm faking it here. People are going to find me out. And um, the, the, the problem there is that, that that can then mushroom anxiety. And, and then actually too much anxiety can interfere with your performance. So it can, just as confidence can become a self-fulfilling prophecy for success, so lack of confidence can be a self-fulfilling prophecy for failure. And so um, what, what, what imposter syndrome, uh, one way of dealing with it is to realize that we're all, that it's healthy to have a slight amount of the imposter syndrome, to realize that the, the, the more senior your position, the more responsible your position, the more leeway there is to not be perfect. <laughs> because you have too many responsibilities and you have the, the more senior the position, the more power you have to, to make mistakes and the bigger the mistakes you can make. <laughs> that's, that's what being promoted involves. And you have to accept that, accept that the whole, the whole uh, aspect of, 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 of being in a job where you feel you're, you're, um, uh, you know, you're, you're an imposter is that, okay, if you genuinely think you, you're, you're out of your skill level and you can't really do that, fair enough. That requires a kind of objective discussion with people. I mean, there are people who get promoted into jobs where they really can't do it. And that's horrible for everyone, including the person, but particularly for the people below that person. But uh, a kind of, you know, if you talk to someone with imposter syndrome and you say to them, you know, well, tell me, what are you actually good at your job? And say, well, Yes, I, I am. I am quite. I am good. I, people would say I'm good at my job, but I just feel like this imposter, and it's that feeling, in spite of actually being able to objectively say, "Yeah, I'm doing my job quite well," it's that feeling that you have to deal with because you want to stop it making you anxious and therefore interfering with your ability to do it. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. We're chatting all things confidence, a fascinating chat with Ian Roberts. I mean, I would say that I use that imposter syndrome pretty much for every podcast that I do because I'm anxious before it. <laughs> I'm anxious when I log on, but you use that sense of I'm doing this. We have this big podcast. It's, it, you know, we've had 4 million listeners. It's all fantastic. I'm brilliant or whatever. And without that little bit of a push, which I suppose that's what you're saying, I wouldn't I probably wouldn't record them. I probably wouldn't have the producer or Gav, the sound guy with me on, on, on the show, but you need that little bit of a push to push you out of your comfort zone and, and, and you know, it, it to get you to be more confident. And sometimes pushing yourself that little bit is good for your confidence. You, you, you wouldn't be doing it, Carl, without that. That's what it is. And Tiger Woods, the golfer said, the day I'm not nervous when I go onto the green is the day I give up. Nerves are a form of energy. And nerves, the, the, the bodily symptoms of nerves are the same as the bodily symptoms of excitement. And if you, you, you can um, jujitsu anxiety into a feeling of excitement because the, the symptoms are actually these are the same and the activity in the brain is very similar by changing the words you say to yourself. So if you say to yourself before your podcast, which I'm sure you do, wow, I'm excited and you're seeing it as a challenge in spite of the nerves, then that, is an, that, that will actually make you perform better because emotion, uh, emotions of anxiety and excitement only crystallize into one of these emotions by the, by the context. And we impose the context by the words we say to ourselves. So the next time any of your listeners have got a difficult conversation to have, a difficult presentation to have, a difficult interview, an anxiety arousing interview. Try and first of all, stand up, sit up straight because posture is important. A constricted posture saps your, your um, making yourself small saps your confidence. So stand proud, head up, shoulders back and say, this is a challenge. This is an opportunity to perform in spite of my anxiety. I am excited. 
Okay, I am excited. These symptoms are symptoms of, of, of excitement just as much as they are of anxiety. And one of the greatest sources of confidence is mastering adversity, is getting through a task in spite of anxiety. And if you do that, that will be, really build resilience. It's a bit like getting a COVID vaccination. It builds your psychological immune system and makes you more, res more resilient and more confident. Again, this is almost like a private one-on-one -on -one consultation. I apologize, <laughs> but everything you're saying is res like so. When I was uh, say 22, my first radio interview with Jerry Ryan as part of Operation Transformation when it started, I remember sitting outside, shaking and anxious and nervous and petrified, and it was along the lines of, "If I don't do this, someone else is going to get the gig, or someone else is going to do it, or I'm not going to. It won't help me hit the goals that I've set out." And for the TV show, that was the very same. And for the podcast, it's been the very same, that if I don't do this, someone else will do it. And as a tool or as a, a self-talk mechanism, it's one of the ways that gets me to, on the, as my producer would kick my ass if I wasn't here, but also it, it gets me onto the session or it gets me onto the corporate, the corporate event or whatever it may be. So that, my point is that self-talk, and for people listening in, that self-talk is really, really important, whether it's negative or positive, pessimistic or optimistic, for improving your confidence, the self-talk is an important tool. It's, it's amazing, the self-talk, uh, Carl. You know, um, so as I go swimming in the, in the sea and, you know, when I'm, you always feel a sense of dread in the winter, you know, going to the sea. And I, what I've learned to do is to say to myself, as I approach the water, saying, this is brilliant. And at the moment I hit the water, I say, wow, it's really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sound like a complete idiot and people look at me and I go in, but it really works. And there's scientific evidence for this. So, you know, the, there's a, a cycling to exhaustion test that's used you know, to, to test people's endurance, also to test their heart function. Where you, you, you put on a, a stationary bike and you have to cycle until you can't cycle anymore. And people can normally do maybe 15 minutes, 10, 15, 20 minutes, you know, maximum. But if you if you get people just to say phrases while they're doing it, like, I can push through this, I can do this, you can do it, <laughs> they increase their their um, endurance by 18%. 18, that's 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 a you know almost a one in five improvement in your 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 actual something that's supposed to be determined by your, your muscle function. So the words you say to yourself, particularly after failure particularly after you've failed at something, you've got a setback, you, a relationship broke down, uh, a job, you didn't get a job, you, you made redundant, a feeling of failure. The words you say to yourself are critical, Carl. Um, and what happens after failure is we tend to say things about ourselves that make us feel we, we have something permanent and solid about us that's not good. I'm unlovable. I'm I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not bright enough. I, I'm just, I'm no good at this. These are, these are awful things to say to yourself. And, and they're not true because our brains are so plastic that who we are and what we can do is, not, is never the de determined by just something inside our head. It's a result of all sorts of interactions we have with the world, all sorts of luck, all sorts of persistence. And so the, we have to realize that when we fail, we have to try and switch on the challenge mindset and say, wow, here's an opportunity. I'm going to learn from this failure. What can I learn from it? This is not saying anything about me as a person. I'm going to learn. <laughs> and what, what happened there? And how can I learn from this so that I can improve things in the future? Attitudes to failure are critical. And, and, and parents' attitudes to failure in their children really are important parents who are who, who are have, have are frightened of failure on behalf of their children frightened of them doing badly at school frightened of their being unpopular or socially excluded that that fear communicates to itself to the children and it solidifies in the children's minds what's what we call a fixed mindset a belief that you know you're endowed with some capacities that are, are limited and um, so so parents and every all of us have to learn to to, to realize that, that failure can be one of the best teachers 
Um, and that if we can persist through failure, as Rumi said, the road only appears with the first step. Woody Allen says showing up is 80% of life. If we can persist through failure, that is like a super duper COVID vaccination that will really, really build our, uh, our confidence and hence our psychological resilience. And it's a topic that goes up time and time again on the show. So we have, you know, we've had Dr. Jerry Hussey on and lots of other people as well in terms of psychologists. And they do bring that up time and time again, as much as they bring up breathing and the power of breathing, but also that ability to re reflect on past experiences that haven't worked out and use those as learning curves, learning processes, and spend some time reflecting before you try and go forward. And in terms of improving your chance of success or your confidence around that, it is important to look back look what didn't work and then spend some time on that before you try and move forward absolutely and but what's critical to be able to do that it depends on your theory about yourself if you believe that you're genetically endowed with a particular personality or genetically endowed with a particular intellectual capacity then that undermines the sense in which your your motivation to, to undergo the, the arduous business of relearning. Because, I mean, learning, learning is always up and down. Think of any skill you've, you've ever learned. You never do it immediately. But the trouble is having a fixed mindset about your, either your intellectual abilities or your personality or your emotions, having a fixed mindset about that, it is a thing over which I don't have control, with which I'm endowed, that undercuts your faith in, be, in just sticking with it and taking the step and, and trying to work through what you've learned from the failure, trying to, to take the actions. It sabotages your, your, your motivation to do the necessary steps to, to learn. Ian, it's been fascinating getting to talk to you today. Every now and again, we have experts on the show who I'd love to bring back for a second episode at some time in the future. And I'd love if you would be one of those experts who will come back and join us uh, in a couple of months' time and we can have more chats and more tips and content from your, your pool of knowledge. It's been fascinating getting to chat to you today. So we really appreciate you coming on today's show. Folks, that's it for this week's episode of Real Health. And my thanks to Ian Robertson for joining me on the show. His new book, How Confidence Works, The New Science of Self-Belief, Why Some People Learn It and Others Don't, is available in all good bookstores and online now. As ever, we're back next week. If you like what you heard, and hopefully you did, don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. And folks, guess what? We'll see you next week for more Real Health. Slán full. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.